over at bangthebook.com. It may be Thanksgiving, but we don't take any holidays over there. Lots of stuff going on. Lots of stuff posted for today's NFL card. Uh, this week in college football, the one NHL game that we have, a bunch of stuff going on over there at the website. Make sure you check it all out. And, of course, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB and the number 200 is that promo code, 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest on the program here today, and that is professional handicapper Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. Brad, how's it going today, man? It's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thanksgiving? Doing very well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always here. And uh, look, I wanted to make sure we got this segment done. It's one of our most popular segments of the week. And I know it's Thanksgiving. People are commuting. So you know, hopefully they can listen to this either on the way out, on the way back, if they're Black Friday shopping, whatever the case is for everybody. So thank you so much for doing this here on the holiday, man. I really appreciate it. And before we get too far into everything, rivalry games, bowl eligibility. Really, I mentioned this in my situational article. There's an implication to every game here this week in college football. Whether it's a team right. trying to get to the playoff, division, conference, or just finish the season on a high note, everyone's got something to play for to a varying degree. Yeah, there certainly is. And then, I mean, if you can find though, those sweet spots, you can find some value. But i got to be perfectly honest with you. I think in some instances this week, especially when I'm comparing it to my pure power ratings, I think some of the teams as far as, you know, bowl eligibility needs, you know, conference championship needs. Some of it, I think, might be actually overpriced in the marketplace. You're paying a premium if you're betting on those teams. Yeah, it definitely seems that way here. There are a few of those games that are kind of shaping up like that. Do you handicap rivalry games differently than you handicap any other game? I'm certainly more prone to taking the dog. Uh, a lot more, to be perfectly frank with you. But it just... It depends. I mean, a little bit of a tweak there, uh, but but other than that, no, not not too much. I, I, in fact, I would say one of my biggest weaknesses is that I probably you know try to come up with a storyline for every handicap where I should just be more math based in, in the end and forget all the storylines. But just generally speaking, more prone to taking a you know big dog that that's especially if the, if it's treated as basically that is their game of the season, where where maybe the big brother, big favorite in the game has bigger things in mind than just, you know, playing their rival. That's an excellent point. That's kind of interesting. And something I, I guess I've never really thought about, and, and I probably should, you know, as somebody who creates content in this business that, like you said, you kind of look for that storyline. You look for that narrative. You look for something that's kind of an interesting talking point, whether you put it in your newsletter <laughs> or you talk about it in your media spots, you know, and obviously I do the same thing with all the content I put out for bang the book that, you know, sometimes we can kind of distract ourselves from, from what really matters in the handicap. I, I certainly uh, with the, cause I mean, the industry is going more media because there's just a demand for it with legalization. And I mean, let's face it. I mean, it doesn't make necessarily for great radio. Uh, why do you like this team? Well, my power rings says the team should be favored by three and the lines pick them. I, I like this team, three point difference, power rating. <laughs> That's not, that doesn't necessarily, if you're running down uh, the entire card like that doesn't make for, you know, a, a great listen. Well, if you come up with the intriguing handicaps, matchup edges, situational edges, key injuries and whatnot. I, I mean, I, I get it. Every All of that goes into a handicap in a game. But a lot of the other stuff outside of the pure math, the pure numbers behind it uh, are, are more for me, uh, for, for media uh, and more for the storylines when the reality is the most important part of your handicap and, and at least the, the starting off point is your power rating. I think sometimes I know I get away from it. It's something that I fall prey to every now and then. Yeah. And obviously it's something that I do too. And I mean, I'm, I'm not a professional handicapper, but you know, covering the industry, you know, I, I sometimes look at my results and I go, well, I should be doing better than I am. But again, you know, there, there's so many other things that you're thinking about that factor into the handicap. You don't focus on the card as a whole. Sometimes you focus on, you know, the matchups that you're going to discuss in a given market or on a given game or something like that, it is tough. And, and maybe that's something that both you and I need to work on here as we head on into next year. We start on Friday with our game breakdowns, game 315, 316, Virginia Tech and Virginia. You know, we just talked about all the storylines, all the note, news and notes, the uh, you know interesting stuff about these games. This is one where there's plenty of it. Flipped favorite, 
one-sided rivalry. Virginia Tech, two-and-a-half-point road favorite. I have Virginia by three, so let's start there. Huge overlay for me. I, I certainly am on the Virginia side, although the worry for me is maybe there's just been a fundamental change with Virginia Tech on both sides of the football for them. On offense, Hendon Hooker at quarterback, they're 6-0 and straight up. He's got 10 touchdowns and zero picks. And, and remember, the, the game he missed was the Notre Dame game, and still Virginia Tech only lost that game by a point. So obviously, they are playing by far the best football they played in the last couple of years last five six games here for Virginia Tech on the defense side of the ball I mean you want to talk storylines I mean it's at least playing out to be true on the field Bud Foster one of the best defense coordinators we've seen in college football last 25 30 years I mean in this final season these in this final game stretch I mean the, the, the defensive players are playing with like their hairs on fire back-to-back -back shutouts for them but that being said and I get it the series history is extremely strong of Virginia Tech. They won 15 straight times in the series. I got to play the number here. My numbers are back in Virginia. Eileen Cavaliers. Yeah, I mean, I got this one Virginia minus one. So I was there on the opening number, and, and that's happened to me a lot this year. I've been on the opener, and then it's moved one way or another. And, and on one hand, it shows my power ratings probably are pretty efficient. On the other hand, you know, maybe I'm not being able to capitalize, capitalize on a number of edges that are out there, but – did you play Virginia already, or are you kind of waiting, hoping for a plus three to show up? Uh, I hate to say this because, I mean, it makes me sound like uh, kind of an a-hole, but I played Virginia way back in May on this one. I got Virginia plus like six and a half. That's the ticket I'm holding. <laughs> but I'll be honest with you, those tickets haven't cashed for me this year. Uh, I mean, I'm 50% at best. I had Oklahoma minus 10 against TCU last week. Couldn't oh. cash that, that, that ticket. Oh. Mainly the pick six, 98-yarder killed me there. But uh, I, mean, I think I got a good ticket, but we'll see. It, uh, oh. it hasn't been a, a good year for those. No, it, it hasn't been a good year for CLV. I mean, I, I wish I could pay my mortgage with closing line value as opposed yeah. to the cash that I've lost on you know games where I've had some good numbers. Maybe some people out there have a good number on this game. 317, 318, Toledo and Central Michigan. And this is probably one of those games that you and I were talking about a little bit in the sense that Central Michigan now, with everything in the world to play for, Western yeah. Michigan loses Tuesday night. Now the MAC West wide open. This one's up from nine and a half to eleven. I presume that you, like me, have this game more in the eight, eight and a half, nine range. But now it's up to eleven. Yeah, I got it. You know, actually closer to seven. And I've been probably still a little too high on Toledo. I mean, I just can't firmly grasp the quarterback situation. They got a couple guys questionable again here. But if you're looking to bet Central Michigan, certainly at this point you're paying a premium on them uh, because of what happened on Tuesday night with Western Michigan losing Northern Illinois. Central Michigan in, they're in. Kudos to Jim McElwain. 1-11 last year to, you know, an overwhelming favorite to at least get to the MAC championship game if you agree with this line. But, I mean, Toledo has dominated the series 9-0 and straight up. 9-0 against the spread the last nine years. I lean Toledo. Uh, I, I think you're paying a premium on Central. I, I'll take the Rockets. And I'll put you on the spot here a little bit, too, and I'll, I'll talk while, I'm, while you're looking this thing up. They're, <laughs> they're going to be a favorite in the MAC championship game, too, you know, when they wind up going and taking on Miami yep. of Ohio. So, obviously, they need to get there, and that would be the concern here for this week. But I think I've got Central minus 4.5 or so against Miami of Ohio. Oh, really? Yeah. You know what? I don't. I got a closer to pick. Okay. Well, All right. maybe we'll see we where that line comes on that one. Yeah. Well, C Central's got a little bit of home field, which I'm not even factoring in. But they'd have oh, a little wow, bit of home yeah. field there in Detroit, too. Yeah, and I'm thinking, am I high on my Ohio in this week's game? I'm not. Oof. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not either. I'm just probably too low on Central Michigan. Mm. All right. Maybe we got a bet on that. I mean, right. I... I certainly, I mean, Central Michigan is getting a lot of publicity, and maybe people are, you know, the Akron game from Miami, Ohio last week. So I got to think of the bet here. Uh, I think I, I'm going to project that even though my power rings have my, I mean, that's not fair. I can't go off my power rings. All right. Uh, if Central's greater than minus one, you win the bet. If uh, if it's Pickham or Miami's favored, uh, well, you, I win the bet. Sound like a right. fair deal? Fair enough. That yeah, you're going to win. I Damn. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you know what? Well, I like here's what I like doing that show. See, I don't get much pushback. Like I put out all these power rings and, and I need to have people look it over and a guy like yourself and yeah, that's probably an oversight on my part and I should pay. I mean if the audience is gonna use my power ratings and I'm gonna use it, I mean I I should pay pay the piper. So in this case the piper being Adam Burke. I mean, hey, I, I like crowdsourcing opinions. You know, I think that's a very important thing. It's a good system of checks and balances for all of us out there. And I admittedly, I mean, you're one of the my top references over the summertime when I'm setting up my initial power ratings. So, you know, we just adjust a little bit differently over the course of the season. And, you know, we'll see what that line comes out there if that, of course, ends up being the MAC championship game. How about game 327, 328 here? Iowa and Nebraska. Iowa, five. This, this number's all over the place. There's a four and a half out there offshore, but it's heavily juiced. Five and a half, six against the Nebraska team trying to get bull eligible. Yeah, I got it at five. I really want to take Nebraska here, but here's why I can't. And this is, you know, I don't blindly bet trends, but I mean, th- this one's probably one of the strongest trends that, that I've seen all year. I mean, Iowa's a road favorite. And this is going back about seven, eight years. Iowa's a road favorite is 20 and 0 straight up, 17, 2 and 1 against the spread. Makes sense. I mean, you got your Midwestern values. I mean, you, you go on the road, you play good defense, you have good special teams in the kicking game, you don't turn it over, you don't overlook teams, you're never too high, never too low. And that's pretty much the Iowa program. 20 and 0 straight up, 17, 2 and 1 against the spread's road favorite. And Nebraska's failed to cover the last eight times they've been catching points at home uh, last three years. That's that's what took me off Nebraska, just those two trends there. Other than that, I mean, I think it sets up nicely for Nebraska. And I think Nebraska, the last two games, even the Wisconsin game, playing some of their better football this season, while Iowa, to me, is leaking oil if you watch them the last three games. The scoreboard hasn't necessarily said it, but you dive into the box scores, they haven't been great for the Hawkeyes the last three games. This is a tough one. I'm right at five, too. So you and I both with the same number here. You know, the, the five wins for Nebraska are South Alabama, Northern <laughs> Illinois, who's been really bad this year. Illinois, a surprise, but that was a really strange game. Northwestern by three. We all know what Northwestern is. Then the blowout of Maryland. But mm. they played close with Indiana. You know, that Wisconsin game, they should have covered the number, as you mentioned. Really, the only two awful performances for Nebraska, Minnesota and Ohio State. And, you know, obviously those are kind of understandable. It's a tough game. It's a tough handicap. I agree with you about Iowa leaking oil a little bit. Not a game that's going to be on my card, but one I definitely wanted to make sure that we were able to talk about here on today's show. All right, let's jump to Saturday. And we hit on a lot of games here already for Saturday. We'll go over some of the same ones with Brad, go over some new ones as well. This one kind of stood out to me a little bit, buddy. Boston College and Pitt, 349, 350. This line's coming down. Boston College needs a win to get to a bowl game. Is that why, or is there something more to it? Uh, powering back set move up a l- little bit. I mean, I got Pittsburgh in the eight, eight and a half range. But, man, I watched Boston College last week, and that was pathetic. I mean, I, I bet Boston College last week. And, that I mean, I was feeling good 20 minutes into the game when they are winning seven to six. But after that, I mean, I, I don't know. And I, I, Pittsburgh's a pretty good defense that can maybe make Boston College one-dimensional. You know, offensively, Pittsburgh looked <laughs> atrocious last week. I don't see it too much value here. Again, my, my number's sitting at eight, eight and a half. I, I mean, I get it. The market wants to play on BC because they need a win to get to a bowl game. Uh, I, I don't see it from what I saw watching them last week against the Irish. I got this one pit minus 10. So I was closer to the opener. It's moving against me. I, I think that, again, you know, you talk about those five win teams. Some people are just going to blindly bet that. Yeah. But, I mean, that's a you know, those teams have pressure, you know, Pitt. Yeah. They're not playing for anything, but also there's nothing to lose, you know, so they can just go out there and, you know, do what they need to do. Whereas Boston college, they got to figure out how to win as, you know, more than a touchdown dog here. So not a game on my radar, but I did at least want to get your take, um, you know, on the line move that we've seen here so far and, and see if there was some sort of explanation for it. Speaking of line moves, 357, 358, just about every week we've talked, Brad, about Ohio or about Iowa State, excuse me, there's been money on them. They're up from three to as high as five and a half now going to Manhattan against Kansas State. Yeah, and my number is closer to three here, so I'm going to go against Iowa State here. Went against them last week with Kansas. I just thought Iowa State 
was laying way too much of a, a number there. And I don't think the market's given enough credit to Kansas State, obviously, because Kansas State's eight and three against the number this year. Uh, and, and they played a bunch of close games. I mean, one possession game in five of their last six, Kansas State. And, and obviously, Iowa State's playing a bunch of close games. Yeah, I'll, I'll disagree with the move here. I get it because statistically, you know, I, I got I, Iowa State even number 17 in my power ratings. I mean, yards per play, they're good. I, I think Iowa State clearly the best four loss team in the country. Uh, take a look at the weather. Uh, winds near 20 mile an hour. So to me, that, that impacts Iowa State more than Kansas State just because Purdy likes to throw it a little bit more. Uh, I'm leaning with the Wildcats. Yeah, that's an excellent point. My number's actually six here on this one. I have Iowa State 15th in my power rating, so maybe I'm a little bit low on Kansas State relative to where you are, but I didn't grab the three because I knew there was going to be weather across the Midwest this week. Wanted to see what happened with that because, as you said, wind very much affects Iowa State more than Kansas State. So didn't grab the three, didn't play this game, certainly not going to play it now with where this line has wound up moving. All right, the game, 367, 368, Ohio State against that team up north. This number is all over the map, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half. There's even some stray nines out there. Seems like books have different needs for this one, and maybe we're not exactly sure what the sharp side is going to look like in this game. Does Brad Powers have a side in this game? Uh, again, weather going to be an issue. Uh, total's gotten bet down significantly already. Uh I lean Ohio State. Look, I, I mean, you if you want to go ahead and trust Michigan, go ahead. I mean, the same story last year where they, you know, coming in the Buckeye game, they blew out Penn State, blew out Wisconsin, blew out Michigan State, playing their best ball, quote unquote, in the season, then went into Columbus and got killed. I don't think they're going to get crushed here, but I, I you know, the, the weakness on Michigan's offense is their offensive line, and go go ahead and back them against Chase Young and company uh, at your uh, demise and. I think the other storyline is going to be how uh, Don Brown, you know, <laughs> calls plays against Ohio State. I mean, in some instances, he's too aggressive, especially when, when the other team's got superior athletes. I, I'm leaning toward Ohio State here, even though my numbers got it closer to seven and a half. Yeah, I, I honestly have no idea what to do with this game. I wasn't going to bet it anyway. I pretty much don't. If I would, I would take an emotional hedge on the other side because it's plus nine in my power ratings. But you know, for all the re- this is really an X's and O's handicap. I know that Ohio State has the recent dominance, so maybe there's some sort of mental edge there. This is an X's and O's handicap. Can Ohio State's linebackers cover the crossing routes? Can Shea Patterson have enough time for those routes to develop and be able to get the football out? Can Dom Brown make amends for last year? Uh, you know, Justin Fields is hurt. What does that mean for Ohio State? There's a lot of stuff going on here in this game. People are going to play it because it's a spotlight game. But I just, I don't think there's a whole hell of a lot of value in it. I really don't. Nah, I don't either. I mean, and then, of course, I mean, hindsight's going to be twenty twenty if the Buckeyes win by three touchdowns or Michigan wins the game outright, although I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, and, and, look, I'm not very anti-Michigan. You just got to keep it real here. Uh, I, it's one of those, you know, I'll believe it when I see it as far as Michigan get it done. I mean, that game last year was, uh, I mean, program-changing. I mean, because I thought the Michigan team was, you know, right up there with with what this year's team is. I mean, we'll see. I think they got a little bit better athletes on the outside, but uh, (laughs) I don't know. To me, Ohio State's the best team in the country. Uh, They they just are, and even last week, I didn't downgrade them last week, even though they didn't cover against Penn State. I thought it just came down to turnovers. I downgraded Ohio State a point after last week just because, well, just because Fields isn't healthy. It it had nothing to do with the gameplay. I mean, look, Ohio State, they held Penn State to 3.55 yards per play. And I know they had the quarterback (laughs) change, but Levis played better than Clifford anyway. Yeah, he did, certainly. So, you know, I mean, there was a path for Ohio State to cover that number. If they go up 21-0 in the first half, you know, like they very well could have, they had the fumble out of the end zone, they had, um, you know, they missed an open guy in the end zone, had a drop in the end zone. That could have been a runaway train kind of game. Yeah, of course, the been. fumbles and all that. So maybe perception is a little low on the Buckeyes here. I don't know, but we're not going to talk about Clemson and South Carolina, but you still have Ohio State number one in your power ratings because yeah. I do too, and I've seen a lot of Clemson love, and I get it, but I also don't because Clemson's played literally nobody for like, what, 10 weeks in a row? 
Yeah, I still have Ohio State one. I, you know, all the Clemson love. I mean, where were you five weeks ago? I was talking about Clemson five weeks ago. Being, hey, I mean, the market was treating them like, like stepchilds after the North Carolina game. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, they just had they, every year they have one of these types of games. Even years that they've won national titles, they almost lost to Troy one year. Uh, I just, I, I didn't get at that point the anti-Clemson sentiment. Now I think that there's probably too much love in the marketplace. Even in that South Carolina game where I got an overlay where my power ranks are strong in South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, I guess we might as well just talk about it. I have a 25 and a half, so I was basically right around the opener. I, South Carolina's offense is bad. That's Ryan true. Holins- Ryan Holinsky just, I mean, he's he's looked like a freshman. He's made some throws. He's missed a lot of throws, too. And then Brian Edwards probably isn't going to play. And if Brian Edwards doesn't play, I don't know who the hell he throws the football to. So... I'm hoping at least one of the rivalry games goes in my favor here because everybody <laughs> who's a regular listener of the show knows that uh, Gamecocks fan by marriage, and I know that one's not going to go well, so hopefully no. the other one does for me. How about game 371-372 here, Wisconsin and Minnesota? Wisconsin, two and a half with extra juice, pretty much market-wide. Another game with weather a factor. Yeah, that's the worry for me because Minnesota likes to throw it, even though it- – I don't think people that watch enough Minnesota, to, you know, uh, understand that. But I mean, Tanner Morgan is number six in the country in QBR, and he's got an elite set of wide receivers, like three or four really good guys. And you know, weather could it certainly impact them a heck of a lot more because Wisconsin doesn't throw it as much. I mean, when you turn it off and, and turn around and hand it off to uh, you know Jonathan Taylor, the, the best running back in the country. Uh, but my numbers have Minnesota by a half here. So I'm going to leave Minnesota. And to me, Morgan is underrated, although he might be, you know, a little bit under wraps due to the weather. And I think Wisconsin's defense is overrated. Uh, I mean, you saw those three shutout games against non-conference opponents. I mean, people are are moving the football against them, uh, especially lately. Nebraska put up nearly 500 yards. So I'm going to leave Minnesota. That's interesting. I, I didn't really think too much about that. My line's actually Wisconsin minus a half. So, you know, both of us in the same spot there with that one. But I didn't really think too much about that because I just sort of looked at this handicap and said, well, I'm going to play the under because the weather is going to be bad. I didn't realize how poor Wisconsin's defense has been of late in conference play. And I mean, again, that's something that you you, you can't take anything for granted and just assume. And, and maybe I got caught assuming here. Yeah. And I mean, even Purdue moved the football against them last week. So. And look at the trend line here. And I just look because I think, you know, obviously every game's into your data points at this point. But, I mean, you got to look at trend lines as well. Because Minnesota, keep in mind, first three games of the season, while Wisconsin's crushing everybody in non-conference, not allowing a single point against their three non-conference opponents, Minnesota almost lost to Georgia Southern, almost lost to South Dakota State. And uh, the, the, there was another game, that oh, Fresno State, in, in double overtime on the road. They almost lost. But last five games, Minnesota's outscoring their opponents by 19 points per game, outgaining them by 165 yards per game. You look at Wisconsin, their last five games, after crushing a ton of teams early, they're only outscoring their opponents by one point per game in the last five weeks, only outgaining them by 52. So Minnesota playing their best ball this season, Wisconsin not so much. That's why I'm leaning Minnesota here. All right, so we jumped down to a game in Conference USA that doesn't really have any implications at all, but an interesting line move here, so I wanted to pick your brain on it. Game 381-382, Middle Tennessee and Western Kentucky. Western Kentucky's been a relatively sharp side throughout the year, but this one's come down from 9.5 to as low as 8. Middle Tennessee is not playing for anything. They can't go to a bowl game. I have a 10.5, and and I circled this game this morning. i got to dive into this one because – if I can't figure it out, the line move, I'm going to have a bet on Western Kentucky uh, and a sizable bet. I just power rings call for it. And I just don't see the path for success for Middle Tennessee against a really good Western Kentucky defense. Uh, it's allowing less than 20 points per game. And Western took a lot of money last week, proved to be correct against Southern Miss. So it is a little bit concerning that a week after all the money was on them, all that money easily won and cashed. And now money's coming against them. Mm. A little bit of a fishy line move, but if I can't figure it out, I'm not going to get paralyzed by it. My power rings are strong in Western Kentucky. I'm going to bet Western Kentucky. It just depends on how big that bet's going to be at this point. Well, again, I mean, we've talked about this a lot. You know, if you're not going to trust your own numbers, who is? So maybe this is one where you do put your money where your power ratings are. 
My line's eight and a half on this game, so I guess it's kind of dropped down into my range. I don't really know the reason for the line move. I don't know if there's an underlying injury situation or something like that. But, you know, Conference USA in general this week, if we could just talk about that for a second, really weird. Because what, uh, did you read up on how they're deciding the, the West Division champion? Uh-uh, I haven't seen that yet. I, I thought UAB wins they're in. Yeah, that, I think that's what it is because they're using like a, a, a BCS era like tiebreaker system. Or oh, some really? kind of weird ass thing like that, because that UAB lines actually flipped from UAB plus one to minus three, yeah. which is what kind of got me looking into it. Because I was like, well, there must be something about this line move that says UAB wins and they're in. Yeah. And I, UAB should win anyway. North Texas isn't very good, but Conference USA is strange, man. They do some <laughs> they do some weird shit there. Between this and then, you know, their conference tournament, they're playing multiple games at the same time in college basketball. It's a weird Yeah, that league, was crazy dude. last year. Yeah, it, it's it's strange. Strange to say the least. Speaking of strange, game in your new backyard here, 389-390, UNLV and Nevada. <laughs> UNLV firing Tony Sanchez, but he's going to coach the rivalry game against Reno anyway. Have you seen anything that would suggest we should play this game one way or the other? Well, here's why I laughed a little. Backyard. <laughs> You know, Reno's an eight-hour drive, pretty much, to where I'm at. Oh, yeah, and, and I'll be well, honest with you, it's I'm one of the worst I'm talking about UNLV. Drive. I'm talking I about know. UNLV. I know. But people just don't grasp that. Hey, I mean, you, you go up to Lake Tahoe and stuff, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You got fly, maybe, <laughs> up there. Uh, I'll never do that drive ever again. Uh, yeah, tough handicap. I, I mean, I, I mean, kudos for them for at least closing out Sam Boyd Stadium last week. I don't know if I trust them here. And then again, you know, Nevada statistically has got to be the worst seven and four team in the country. But I mean, they're playing their best ball of the year, one and covered three straight games. I thought the market pretty much threw them in the trash after the Hawaii game. Uh, but I, I got it right around seven, seven and a half is my power rating. I don't have a bet on it. Yeah, I got it seven. So uh, I'm probably not going to touch it either. But, you know, Nevada is a team that I have had to upgrade because I kind of threw them away. Not after the Hawaii game, but after San Jose State with the close win and then the blowout loss to Utah State, who's not very good. At that point, I really dropped them, but I've had to elevate them here the last two weeks. Two impressive road wins. Carson Strong back at quarterback playing well. But I think I talked about this a little bit with our good buddy uh, Brian Leonard on Tuesday. When you look at Nevada, I mean, it's amazing. They lost 77 to 6, 54 to 3, 36 to 10, and 31 to 3. I mean, I guess if you're going to lose, that, that might as well be the way that you do it. Yeah, there you go. You know, burn the barn, man, in order to save it. Well, I, and then and, and the question about it then is what do we do with this team going into next year? They've been outscored by 126 points on the season, 80 points in seven conference games. People are going to look at them and say, oh, clear regression candidate because you know they're going to have at least seven wins, probably eight and quite possibly nine with a very negative point differential. But you've got yeah. to look at the context of it here because, you know, I mean, getting blown out by Oregon is is one thing, yeah. you know, but it's a strange Hawaii body of work. Another, though. Yeah, that, that was we were both on Nevada in that game. Yeah, I was one of my worst losses in my entire career. Well, I was on Troy last week, so I, I don't up think we need that. I don't think we need to wait until next year. I'm very. I, I was thinking about it when I was writing this the game up. I'm anxious to see how Nevada's treated in the marketplace come bowl game, because I I, I kind of want to go against them, but it's all going to come down to matchup. But because I'm really intrigued to see how the market treats this team, even in the, in this year's bowl game. I am too. But I'll say this. I think Jay Norvell might be a pretty good coach. Oh, certainly. I mean, he's certainly better than, uh, you know, what they had there before him. I mean, I'm not talking Chris Salt, but I'm talking Brian Polian. He certainly elevated the program since then. We'll see. He's he's had some fortunate wins, even in that bowl game last year. Even though when I was on him in that Arkansas State game, they were badly outgamed, didn't even deserve to win it. Yeah, I guess we'll have to see. That'll be an interesting one for us to talk about come bowl season, to be sure. Yeah. Speaking of bowls, the Iron Bowl, 397, 398, Alabama, Auburn. Yeah, how you like that segue? Alabama yeah. and Auburn here, three, anywhere from three to four out there in the market, depending on where you look. Kind of interesting to see that the three at five times actually minus three, minus 15 on Alabama. 
but most of the market three and a half. What what are you doing with this game, man? Are you doing anything with it? Oh man, I, I'm gonna have a bet on Auburn. It won't be a big one. Power ratings are strong on Auburn. I got Auburn one, and I think most people say I'm crazy for it. But I went through both teams, and that was one of my projects this week. I'm still not done with it, but I've re I've gone ahead and regraded every team's game, every game that they played so far. I'm about halfway through it. Uh, and, and I regraded both of these teams' games every, going all the way back to week one. And uh, I just I, – right now, I don't think the market's treating Tua Tunga by low as a seven-point downgrade. I think they're a little too positive on Mac Jones. I'm going to say who in the hell has he played? He's played Arkansas and Western Carolina. And, and I look, as bad as Auburn is offensively, and that's my biggest concern here, Bo Nix against Nick Saban, a Nick Saban defense. But Auburn legitimately on defense – I mean, is clearly top 10. They haven't allowed anybody, even LSU, to score more than 24 points uh, against them. And uh, I'm going to take the Tigers here plus three and a half. Yeah, I mean, that's the way I have to look, too. I do have this one line three and a half. So maybe I'm not taking as aggressive of a stance as I need to on the drop off to Mac Jones. But I mean, what was your drop off? I want to say it was six and a half. All right. Spread over yeah, two weeks. Spread over two weeks though, because I, I just I, I don't know. I mean, maybe Mac Jones is awesome. Maybe he's not yeah, too uh, awesome. He's, I don't think he's he isn't, but <laughs> we'll see. Well, You'll probably prove me wrong. I'm just I mean, I just don't get it. I I this is one where I have asked other people and, and I've asked them, well, what what do you have Alabama down on the season? And I only have Alabama down with Tua. I mean, I basically have him down seven points. Just to, I mean you put Tua back in. I think the same of Alabama is what I did at the start of the season. And, you know, I got Auburn pretty flat, if not just maybe a point higher, which I think is totally fair. They're eight and three, and their only three losses are against top 10 teams. So I, I just can't figure this one out. But I'm, I'm again, I'm going to trust my power rating. Give me Auburn. Always making me dig to find my damn opening season power ratings. What the hell, man? Um, well, it's a good sign because I really don't ask anybody else, which means I really don't give a damn about anybody else's. Well, that's fair. I haven't moved Auburn at all over the course of okay. the season. They're right I think where I had be them. Fair. Alabama's down five points for me, so okay. I guess that isn't enough. But I had Alabama a little bit lower coming into the season because I was a little bit worried about you know some of the talent that they had lost on defense. So I, it's tough. It, it's so because again, I mean, you're talking about replacing one you know elite player with at least a guy who has elite potential. So. I don't, and, and also, too, Alabama's wide receivers. I mean, that's that's one of the most ridiculous groups of wide receivers we've ever seen in college football. Yeah. So, really, you know, if he gets them the football, they can make stuff happen. So, I don't know, but I agree with you about Auburn's defense. The, the one thing I'm kind of wondering about, and I, I mentioned this earlier on in the week, I had a buddy of mine who went to Auburn, still kind of involved with the program in the athletic department, say that Gus Malzahn, I mean, this seems like it's going to come to a, you know, maybe mutual agreement to split ways. Really? So that's kind of interesting. Wow. Does he go to Arkansas then? Because that's where he was a high school coach for so many years. Maybe. That's what people are. But why would you go from the rich? I to have no idea. Stay in the same division and go to Arkansas and try yeah. and, and build that thing up. I I don't know. But it, I mean, that's also, you know, there's so many things to talk about in week 14 here. That's a consideration, too. You got some lame duck head coaches, some that are already fired, like Tony Sanchez. You know, and then you've got some of these questions of, who goes where, you know, something like we're not going to talk about SMU and Tulane, I don't think. But, you know, where does Willie Fritz go? Because he may get a bigger job now. You know, is this the last game for the coach that you know and love? The guy that recruited you? Yeah. There's a lot going on here in week 14, to say the least. All right. So we go from one rivalry game to another. 399-400, Louisiana Monroe and Louisiana. You know, same type of fanfare here for this game. Louisiana, <laughs> a 19 and a half point favorite, but they've got a rematch with App State next week. So what do you think? Is Louisiana just that good to go ahead and overcome that spot and cover this number? I got it at 21. I, I found it interesting that the road team 17 and two against the spread in the series, the road team 17 and two. But even though they got that big game on deck, I can't get over this, the matchup at the line of scrimmage that favors UL Lafayette. I mean, they average 276 rushing yards per game, and UL Monroe allows more than 250 rushing yards per game. I, I can't get over that. And, I mean, look what Lafayette did to Troy last week. I mean, that was 
utter domination. That was their best performance of the season. This is a UL Lafayette team that I think is really good. In fact, I mean, powerings wise, uh, I mean, I got Lafayette. I got uh, it's going to be a really good. Let's just put it this way: it's going to be, be a really good Sun Belt championship game next week because I have both App State and UL Lafayette my top forty. Yeah, I do too. What do you have that line next week? I've got App State. Uh, let's see, they're going to be at home. I've got App State minus a touchdown. Uh, do, do, do. I got shorter than that. G- going to be maybe more in the five range for me. Okay. All right. Fair enough. And, and, and what's interesting about this game is that last year at Monroe, Louisiana was minus two and a half, I think. So we've got a substantial adjustment Ooh. for these two teams, which does speak to the fact that, you know, Louisiana having a phenomenal season here. You got to give them a lot of credit for that. How about game 407, 408? A little bit of bedlam here. Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. 12 and a half, the predominant number as high as 13 and a half out there. Oklahoma could use some style points here. Yeah, I don't think they're going to get it. At least I hope not because I bet Oklahoma State. I got closer to nine. I, I think the market's downgraded Oklahoma State too much uh, from going from Spencer Sanders to Drew Brown. I'll say that Spencer Sanders would have given Oklahoma State a better chance to beat Oklahoma outright, but he'd also been a better chance uh, of Oklahoma State losing by five touchdowns because he's a turnover machine. Uh, Drew Brown hasn't thrown. I I say this and watch him go out and throw three, four picks. But Drew Brown hasn't thrown a pick this year, five touchdowns, zero interceptions. And he didn't throw picks at Hawaii and a Hawaii system that that we've seen. The Hawaii quarterbacks, no matter who's in their last couple years, have been turnover machines. So uh, Oklahoma State's been good as a dog, 10-1, and last 11 games against the spread as an underdog. I, I, my numbers call for it. I like Oklahoma State here plus the, the 13. Big difference between you and I here. I got this one 15 and a half. So we got a oh, real wow. what big is the, difference. What well, is going I, on? I, I dropped Oklahoma State three from Spencer Sanders to Drew Brown. All right. I didn't that much. What do you got? I always like looking now we're at the end of the year. Where do you have? Because to me, that, that that's where I, you know, I look at teams, you know, because can make, I can make more sense of it. Where do you have Oklahoma? Start of the season to now. Let's see. Right now, I have Oklahoma seventh in the country. They're uh, power rated a 90 for me. I had them sixth at 88 coming into the season. So right, they're up a couple fl- points for me. All right. I got them flat. And maybe it's just I've downgraded them too much the last couple of games. I get it. That box scores have been really good for them the last couple of weeks, but scoreboard hasn't. But it's been four games now where the scoreboard hasn't been good for Oklahoma. And then Oklahoma State. I mean, I got them down a couple points. I mean, this is an eight and three team. Their season win total was like six and a half. I mean, I think that's fair. I mean, maybe I just haven't downgraded them enough. Not only Spencer Sanders out, but also, I mean, you lose uh, your best wide receiver, one of the better wide receivers in the country. It's all going to come down to Chuba. If he can run, uh, I think Oklahoma State can keep it close. If he can't, then they're going to get crushed. Yeah, I have Oklahoma State down three points from the start of the year, and, and that's the Spencer Sanders adjustment. And, and I even right. made a Wallace adjustment, too. That being said, Oklahoma State did peak in my top 25. I think they were around 80 or so, but then I kind of scaled them back between the injuries and, and some of their outcomes. So, you know, they have been – I think the overall theme here is they've been a very tough team for me to power rate over the course of the season. How about game 411, 412 here? Southern Miss and Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic – controlling its own destiny in conference USA East here. Uh, they've got this game against Southern Miss and they're laying a pretty big number to do so. Yeah, they are. And I only got it at six, but I think it comes down to, you know, Southern Miss quarterback, Jack Abraham. Is, is he going to play? I just looked at it this morning. I don't have a firm answer. It looks like he might be a game time decision. So that's why the line's a little steep. And it's also steep because it's a, a win and in type of situation for Florida Atlantic. I mean, they certainly benefited from Marshall going down last week uh, against Charlotte in that game. Oh, that didn't work out, that Brad Lambert a nugget I gave you. I'm sorry, buddy, if you bet, <laughs> ended up betting on Marshall because of me. Uh, I don't have a, a big play. I mean, if Abraham, if it's last minute, gets checked in and we're still dealing with the line here and it hasn't moved, the market hasn't reacted, I would lean Southern Miss here. For what it's worth, speaking of Marshall, man, do I love them this week against FIU. I do too, man. That was a game I just circled. Yeah, that, that's an awful spot for FIU. I mean, not even just coming off the win over Miami, but it got them bowl eligible too. So they legitimately yeah. have nothing to play for with that long trip up to Huntington. That's game 361-362. Uh, but in any event, in this one, 
I mean, I got this one more in the in the three, three and a half range. So I'm I'm down way off from the market. Maybe Abraham's not gonna play. Maybe that's why this line is that high. I, I don't know if I love Florida Atlantic, though. I mean, I, what does the body of work look like for this team? I mean, they're not as good as they were last year or as good as they were two years ago from a talent standpoint, but maybe this is Kiffin's best coaching job. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you can make a case that I mean, I don't know. I just a lot of these Conference USA teams this year, uh, I mean, for a two, three week period, they look like, hey, that's the best team in Conference USA. And then they, they, they have a hiccup. I do agree that, you know, it's probably Kiffin's best coaching job after last year being a horrible job by him. Um, you know, maybe showing that his first year wasn't such a fluke here. So I don't know, but he seems like a high variance type of guy where, you know, maybe, maybe next year there'll be value going up, you know, fading FAU. Uh, next week's game, I like that we're doing this. Uh, we're FAU is probably going to play UAB. It's going to be at FAU. What? Where do you have that line? I got like ten. Nine, where the hell are you, UAB? Six and a half. Yeah. Home field. Yeah, hey, FAU oh. minus six and a half. Oh wow! All right. Yeah, All right. Well, fair enough. I mean, UAB. Look, I get it. UAB's played an awful schedule. I fully grasp that but you know what when they stepped up and played Tennessee not that Tennessee's great but I mean Tennessee's at least a decent team the offense was an abomination but the defense played damn well I, I really respect that UAB defense a lot and maybe I that's why that. they're high in my power ratings I agree and they've had quarterbacks issues with Johnston in or out so that might be the disparity there all right game 417 418 here is Notre Dame and Stanford Notre Dame laying three scores on the road in Palo Alto. And and I don't know if you're going to have a strong opinion one way or another on this game, but my God, Stanford has fallen a long way. Yeah. And I should have, I got a little bit of a tip. A guy had, you know, one of the key guys at Stanford that uh, works for Stanford. And he kind of hinted off the record that this was by, and this is probably, this is back in August said, Hey, this is by far the poor Stanford team he's seen in a decade plus. And, of course, I didn't utilize that information like I should have. But, yeah, I, I've i downgraded Stanford more than uh, 10 points in my power ranks since the start of the season. I only got this game 14, but I'm certainly not going to bet Stanford. The worry that I'd have, if you're going to lay the lumber with Notre Dame, I mean, there is going to be, at least the expectation right now, very bad weather in this one. And we're talking 20-plus mile-an-hour wind, rain, and keep in mind the field conditions at Stanford – even ideal situations, it's not the best turf in the country. In fact, I think it's one of the worst fields. Uh, it, it could be a very sloppy game uh, on Saturday. So uh, the unders already taken a hell of a lot of money already, and I expect it to even go further down. Well, that's an excellent point there. From 52 down to 47 and a half, and weather obviously a factor in a lot of places here this week and will continue to be as we go forward here. Let's go to 429, 430. BYU and San Diego State. I think this is an interesting game. San Diego State, nothing to play for. They lost out on their chance to be in the Mountain West Conference title game. Uh, they have a little bit of a history with BYU, I guess, so maybe there's that. BYU, five in a row, playing great football. Zach Wilson back. Road favorite of three, heading out to the West Coast. Yeah, I got a one and a half, although I'm not anxious to bet San Diego State at this point. Mm, I, I mean... Unders 10 and 1 in San Diego State games. And again, weather can be an issue. But I mean, the total is only 39. Uh, I don't have a strong take on this one. BYU by one and a half, my power rating. So it, it says, hey, you should be taking San Diego State here. I'm not, I took San Diego State last week and uh, it was not pretty against Hawaii. I, I got a good number and ended up with a push. But I mean, most people probably got a loss there with the Aztecs last week against Hawaii. I got this one five, so it's moving towards my number a little oh, wow. bit here. At at three, I'm not going to play it. Three and extra juice, I'm not going to play it. At two and a half, it would have been a great grab early on in the week, but I don't remember what I was doing on Sunday, but I wasn't able to grab it. In any event, I got this one a little bit higher. You know, I'm not a believer in that San Diego State offense, and, you know, what's going to be really interesting is, you know, we again, we start looking ahead here. San Diego State's bowl game. Rocky Long is really good in bowls, very, very good in bowls. That three three five stack, teams just – for whatever reason, they're not ready to play it. But that offense is in a, is just awful. So I'll be curious to see what happens with their bowl game line. That's something we'll be able to talk about yeah. you know, hopefully here in a couple of weeks' time. Certainly. And, I mean, at, a couple of years ago, I thought he was an excellent bowl coach. I mean, he crushed Cincinnati 
and then crushed the Houston team back to back years. But uh, last year <laughs> wasn't pretty because I went back to them and Ohio crushed them. I mean, they, they've been a little high variance, and we've seen that. I mean, they've lost a couple games here the last couple of years. I think three of them as like a two touchdown plus favorite. So a uh, little bit of variance with San Diego State. So. And there might be some opportunities if they're laying a number, forget taking the dog, just take the dog on the money line. That Cincinnati bowl game, I remember that. That I think that might have been the year that we started doing the Daily Show, and all of us hammered San Diego State in that game because it was it was the Hawaii Bowl. So Cincinnati yeah. was basically getting a vacation. San Diego State plays there every other year. I mean, that was – they were what, minus – I want to say field goal favorite or something like that, one by 35. That might yep. have been the easiest win we've collectively ever had here on the show. Would be nice to get another one of those here in this bowl season. One more game on the college side, then we'll spend a few minutes on the NFL. We go out to the island. Army and Hawaii, the degenerate special, the chase game on Sunday morning for East Coasters. Man, this is an intriguing as hell handicap. Hawaii's minus two and a half, but they play Boise next week in the Mountain West Conference title game. You really got to wonder how focused they are to try and stop the option this week. Yeah, so my pure power rank's four, but this is the rare time I'm going to go against it. And I, I just think that there's a decent chance. I'm not saying, you know, it's. I think you got a decent bet with Army regardless. But I think there's a decent chance Hawaii's just not interested in that game. And the last team you want to play if you, you have some disinterest is a service academy. I don't question the motivation for Army off a buy, buy on deck, need a win to, to stay, you know, in line for bowl eligibility. Remember, they need seven because they played a couple of FCS teams. I, I just think Hawaii run defense is not good. You saw Air Force run over them earlier this year. I don't think that gets fixed. I, I like Army. It's one of my top plays of the week. I, I, I bet them early in the week, and I would still think there's value now. Yeah, my line's four, too. But again, I mean, th this situation is just so unique, really, to this week in college football. And you know, not only that, if I'm Hawaii, man, I'm not playing any of my defensive line starters. I'm not playing a single one. I'm not letting those guys get cut blocked for 65 rushing attempts when I play Boise State next week. Yeah. And I know that Hawaii is a long shot to beat Boise State anyway, but I'm not putting anybody on defense at risk in this game. I don't know if Nick Rolovich goes that route, but I know it's the route that I would go. We'll see. And it, I mean, he's kind of a unique, interesting character. Uh, he, he defies logic in some instances, especially with his quarterbacks, almost like Spurrier back in the day, the way he shuffles his quarterbacks in and out. But uh, <laughs> I mean, he's maybe he's thinking, hey, we don't have a shot next week. That's the game we roll over and die. Let's win our final home game and get the nine wins on the season. Yeah, that's a good question. Is is Hawaii going to play in the Hawaii Bowl? I'm thinking so, and it looks like it's going to be against BYU. Though. That's a nice little matchup. Ooh, I'll take BYU. Yeah, me too. All right, so we transition over to the NFL side here for a few minutes, and uh, big game in the 1 o'clock time slot, bright and early for you out there in Sin City. San Francisco and Baltimore. Baltimore, five and a half or six-point favorite, depending on where you look, and uh, – I mean, these two teams couldn't have been more impressive in their primetime slots last week. Yeah, I can't bet against Baltimore right now. I mean, they've had, and I looked this up, no team in NFL history has ever had a, a better five-game stretch against the spread where they've covered by a combined 127.5 points. Every single game covering by 17 points or more, 127.5 points above expectation. That's Baltimore last five games. And, and then some people are going to say, well, who'd they play? I mean, it's unbelievable who they played. They played four playoff caliber teams, starting with the Seattle game. And, of course, you know, the win over New England and crushed the Rams. I mean, a Rams team that was vying for a playoffs, not so much now. But, I mean, it's been unbelievable for the Ravens. I can't fade that at this point. Uh, I have Baltimore number one in my power rings as far as the NFL goes, even above New England at this point. I don't think it's a s extreme value because I think you're starting to pay a premium on them. But I, I certainly don't want the Niners here. You know, the, the dreaded, wet, you know, West Coast to East Coast, 10 a.m. start time. Yeah, it's it's tough because I love Kyle Shanahan. I mentioned that before here on the show many times over. I think he'll have a very good game plan here. And, and obviously, San Francisco is very athletic on the defensive line. But That's a good call there, too. Can you really plan for a guy like Lamar Jackson? I mean, look at what Russell Wilson does week in and week out with a collection of dog shit around him. 
I mean, the dude just improvises and makes plays and Seattle wins games. I mean, if you've got a traditional pocket passer, you can figure it out. If you've got a run only quarterback, you can figure it out. Lamar can throw and run. I just, I don't know how you plan for this cat, man. I don't know how you do it. If Belichick couldn't figure it out, I mean, in my opinion, the greatest coach in the history of football period, he couldn't figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what, if anyone's going to figure it out, at least this year, I think you might, this might be one of those cases where you need an off season to figure this one out. Yeah. And teams had an off season of seeing Lamar Jackson. They still can't figure it out. So I, I don't, I mean, does, does Baltimore just go ahead and win it all? They're the favorites now. I mean, they're three to one. They're even the favorites over the Patriots now. Mm. I don't think there's value in futures markets. Yeah, I mean, obviously you're better to roll it over consistently. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I, so I got him number one in my power ranks right now. If you gave me, you know, a hundred bucks and said, hey, you, you got to bet on who's going to win the Super Bowl, it'd be a Baltimore for me right now. All right, so how about the game right below it on the board? 457, 458, Tennessee and Indianapolis. Indianapolis, two and a half point favorite here in this one. Uh, total on this game coming in at 43. Pretty important AFC South game here. Yeah, I like Andy. I, I mean, I get it. Tannehill's played really well for Tennessee, and, and he's certainly an upgrade over Marcus Mariota. But if you go through the last five games for Tennessee, I think they benefited. And here's how they benefited. Those four ga- four out of those five games, the four games they won, those four games they covered were all at home. The one game they lost were on the road against Carolina. The Colts have a couple extra days to prep. I think Frank Reich is one of the more underrated coaches in the NFL, so I like that he's got a couple extra days. And he's dominated the series. They're 27-6 and six against Tennessee going back to 2003. And here's one digging up. The Colts against winning teams in the last two years, teams that have coming into the game, at, you know, are better than 50% winning percentage, 11 and one against the spread. That's Indy. That's a sign wow. to me of a good coach. Give me the Colts minus two and a half. I like it quite a bit. Wow. That's a hell of a number there. Now I, I was kind of thinking Tennessee a little bit. Cause I'm, you know, I like Indy. I love Frank Reich much like you do, but there's something that just seems like it doesn't click week in and week out with this team. So Tennessee was kind of a starting point for me, but you definitely just took me off the Titans well, there. No, I don't know, man, because I'll tell you, one of my favorite NFL guys who I, I trust the most, he's on Tennessee quite a bit. So th- don't let me talk you out of it. We, we, Him and I got a pretty big bet going head-to-head there. Yeah, but you're crushing the NFL, not just this year, but lifetime. So <laughs> yeah, I don't get it, man, because uh, it's almost embarrassing. I mean, I spent time on it, but – I don't spend if you if you think and I'm spending 30, 40 hours a week on the NFL. I mean, that's crazy. Although the the numbers would think that I am. And I don't I don't get it, man. <laughs> I just I work a few very few hours a week on the NFL and every I've never had a losing season in the NFL. And I wish I could go back in a, in a time machine because when you're 61 percent over five years in the NFL in a newsletter that comes out on Wednesday, and if I just bet those three games each and every week that you get, I'd be a very rich man right now. Life would be a lot more simpler and a lot less stressful for old Brad Powers. Let's go to game 461-462 here. We haven't talked about this one yet this week. Oakland and Kansas City. Kansas City 10-point favorite. Andy Reid off the bye. Oakland off of whatever that was against the Jets last week. What do you think about this one here? I'm going under. Weather, 20-plus mile-an-hour winds. And I think the Chiefs' defense – is getting a little bit better. Derek Carr, uh, is certainly when the weather's colder and uh, he's out in the conditions, he's not as good. We even saw that a little bit last week. Going under more than anything. Uh, but read off a bye, uh, I think that they step on the throat a little bit of Oakland. Uh, I would lean also the Chiefs here. All right, well then, since Thanksgiving is about excess and gluttony, I'll add one more NFL game just for the fun of it. Because right. this one's got a little bit of local flair for us. 471, 472, Cleveland and Pittsburgh. I know there are some very eye-popping statistics about this game, about (laughs) Cleveland being favored, about Cleveland sweeping the regular season. Do they do it? Do they live up to it? No, I I got Pittsburgh here. I mean, Cleveland, I mean, everyone, it's being widely reported now. First time they've been favored in Pittsburgh since 1989. That was the last time Cleveland won a division. I mean, they've lost 15 straight times in, in Pittsburgh. I here's where I think the mispricing is. I think Hodges at quarterback's an upgrade over Rudolph. I mean, lost in all that, you know, melee at the end between Rudolph and Garrett. 
was the fact Rudolph was a piece of crap in that game. Literally. I mean, four interceptions. And here's what I don't understand. These two teams played, and I get it, Cleveland easily won and covered that game. They were the better team. But that game, they were a three-point home favorite. This line of two would say, if you flip the home away, would say right now Cleveland at home would be an eight-point favorite over Pittsburgh. Get the hell out of here. Give me the, the Steelers here plus the two. This does seem like a, a pretty big overreaction, to, to say the least. And again, I mean, I look, Cleveland's played well the last couple of weeks, but I still find it very difficult to trust them. I mean, especially in this spot where, you know, they haven't swept Pittsburgh in the regular season since 1988. I was two years old. I don't know what you were, but I was two years old. Five. At that. So, I mean, look, and that's the thing, too. I mean, you and I grew up. Obviously, you were, you know, more in Western Ohio, but I grew up in Cleveland. I've only known the Browns to suck. And it's very yeah, hard I got for very, me. Yeah. It, it's very hard for me to wrap my head around them being favored in Pittsburgh and taking care of business in Pittsburgh. It, it just is. I don't see it. I mean, I got faint memories of, you know, Kozar and Webster Slaughter and Eric Metcalf and whatnot. But I mean, those are, they're starting to fade away. Let's just put it that way. There were only a few years of my childhood when Cleveland was actually good. My memories of those guys like Webster Slaughter, Ozzie Newsom, you know, some of those guys come from playing Tecmo Super Bowl for Nintendo. <laughs> there you go. So that's how I remember uh, the, the glory days. Of the Cleveland Browns, you know, running out there with QB Browns playing uh, playing NES there. All right, in any event, Brad Powers, professional hate gapper over at bradpowersports.com. What's going on over at the website right now, brother? Well, first, let, let me say this. I'm very, th- you know, this time of year, holiday season, you, you do a little bit of reflection because the football season is starting to wind down. I'm very thankful for everyone that listens to this segment. And legitimately, I'm just not saying this because Adam's a friend. I'm pretty blunt with my friends, my family, and even people I don't know that much. Uh, but this is my favorite segment I do each and every week. It's one of my favorite hours of the whole week. So I just want to, you know, all the listeners out there have a very happy and safe Thanksgiving to everyone's families out there. Brad Bauer uh, the newsletter. I talk about it each and every week game right up. So in every single college game, we've got a couple of weeks left in the regular season. You got the NFL still five weeks left of that, the regular season. Then you get a pick on every single bowl game, pick on every single NFL playoff game. It's 49 bucks through the Super Bowl. I'll be perfectly frank. The college has been an absolute piece of crap this year. NFL, though, 63% against the spread, 61% lifetime. The 49 bucks is probably worth it, just the NFL alone. But don't buy for the picks. Just buy for the info, bradpowersports.com. Well, and you are very good in bowl season for college football. So that is coming up. Good way for you to get back on track there. And I think there are some good opportunities this week as well. And uh, I'll echo your thoughts. I love doing this hour with you, man. And I love the support our listeners give, not just this segment, but the show in general. So thank you so much to everybody out there that listens. And uh, thank you to you, man, for carting out an hour every week and uh, hopping on my show and having some fun with me. So again, that's Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com at Brad Powers and the number seven on Twitter. Always a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you again next week. All right. Sounds good. Happy Thanksgiving.